So Paul has recently moved to Stanford University where he is a senior fellow of international security. And before that, he spent nearly two decades as a professor at the University of Michigan in the, both the School of Information and the History Department. At Michigan, he helped build our counterpart, our sister group, the Science, Technology, and Society program, which continues to be a robust community of scholars interested in the politics of knowledge around the world. I expect he's probably arranging a similar synergies at Stanford um, now that he's there. Over the course of his career, Paul has explored the multifaceted history of computers and what he calls information infrastructures, moving from studies of their military genealogies and connections to cognitive science on the one hand, to analyses of how they have shaped and changed what we know and what we think we know about climate science on the other. In his first book, published in 1996, The Closed World, Computers and the Politics of Discourse in Cold War America, Paul has helped us understand the unexpected and unpredictable paths that led the United States military to invest in digital mainframe computers. He not only explains how this investment reverberated with ideologies of command and control and cultures of secrecy, but also how it produced a new array of metaphors about the mind within Cold War America. His second book, published in 2010, A Vast Machine, Computer Models, Climate Data, and the Politics of Global Warming, placed Paul at the forefront of a handful of scholars who understand how knowledge about climate, past, present, and future, gets constructed through such things as mathematical models, simulations, and even satellites, among other tools and techniques. Thanks to the work Paul did in A Vast Machine, we have a much richer understanding of the way models interact with real-world data to, to produce robust truth claims. The fact that these claims are mediated by machines and depend on vast infrastructures makes them no less real, easy to contest, but also easy to defend. The book received three different prizes and was named a Book of the Year by The Economist. Most recently, Paul has been invited by coordinators of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to be a lead author for the working group on physical aspects of climate science and change during the next four-year round, which I think begins this June. As far as we know, he is the first social scientist to serve in this role since the panel was founded in 1988. No pressure. <laughs> Today, he will be speaking to us about truth under siege, making climate knowledge in an age of transparency, skepticism, and science denial. Please join me in welcoming Paul Edwards. Thank you so much, Helen. That was very kind. And I should say that the uniqueness of that position is only with respect to working group one of the IPCC, which is on the physical science. There have been many social scientists in the other two working groups. All right, I'm going to start this talk today with a very brief video. And when I show this video, I want you to see two things. I want you to see the results of instrument data collected all over the world since 1880 and processed with algorithms to produce this video. The other thing I want you to see is the rise of industrial civilization based on fossil fuel. Here we go. So when I say these are produced by algorithms, this is a five-year moving average. The baseline is the 1951 to 1980 average. And what you're seeing, the reason, of course, for the heating is the greenhouse gases that we have emitted over this long period of time into the atmosphere. So let's just leave that on the table and we'll come back to it. I'm going to start now with some concepts from an old book, An Evolutionary Theory of Technological Change. Uh, that part of that book was about how organizations persist over time with changing people and changing roles in the organization. So the question is, what is it that makes it possible for an organization to keep doing the same thing even though different people are coming in and going out of the same roles? And one explanation for that was routine. That is, an organization develops a way of doing things and as new people come in, they learn this routine and that's the memory that the organization leaves. 
The second idea was truce. So in any large organization, or even in, say, a small academic department, there are always conflicts. There are people who don't do their job, who do their job in a way that's different from the way that somebody else thinks they should do their job. There are interest groups that have conflicting positions and so on. And yet, the organization continues and works and moves forward. So Nelson and Winter called that a truce. Important, you know, a routine serves as a truce among these conflicting groups. And that's why it's possible for uh, rule breaking and defiance to take place and the organization can still continue to work. The last concept was targets. And here what they are talking about is that routines become models for new routines and they also become sort of norms or goals that the organization tries to achieve and may not always actually achieve. Now, in the context of climate science, I'm going to apply this in a different way. So memory is the same issue. How is it that we know about the past, especially as we time goes on and we learn more about that same past? So you just saw a presentation of climate data in that video. Those data today look a little bit different than they did 30 or 40 or 50 years ago even the data about the time before that period, because we have learned more about how the data were collected, how they were combined, and what needed to happen to them to make them all commensurable, and we'll come back to that point. So it's holding and revising information. The truce aspect is the way in which a global system has formed to uh, collect and process information about the weather, which then becomes information about the climate as time goes on. And in that process of organization, there have been many conflicts and controversies, that some of which have been settled and others which continue and remain, and yet the process moves forward and it works pretty well. And finally, of course, you have the phenomenon of targets. So new, older routines become models for new ones, when satellites first become meteorological instruments, they are, their data is processed as if they were weather balloons. So they use the methods developed for weather balloons to handle that data, and it takes 30 years before they're able to integrate them in a different way that's more uh, adequate to the type of data they actually are. Okay, with those concepts on the table, let's move forward and talk about a different kind of target. <laughs> And this is the target we're all uh, thinking about today, the, the way in which climate knowledge itself has become a target in the current uh, political environment. So here's what I'm going to do. I'll talk a little bit about the weather knowledge infrastructure and move through this very quickly, but just to lay some groundwork. And then about climate data and data models and how, how data are processed. And this part will all be background for a discussion of the truce. That's the glass laboratory concept, the idea of science as a, a system in which people in principle should be able to see in the window and see what scientists are doing and therefore uh, come to agree with them and accept what they, they are, are saying is true. Then we'll do some uh, climate data controversies and come back to the siege. So the weather knowledge infrastructure. What do I mean by a knowledge infrastructure in the first place? I'm talking about systems that collect information and process it in a routine way to create knowledge of, of natural and human systems. There are lots of these. The key point here is that we're, I'm not talking about sort of cutting edge research science, but about knowledge systems that are relatively stable and which we rely on on a daily basis. So weather forecasts are a good example of that. So are things like uh, labor statistics, uh, the National Census Bureau, and so on. There are controversies within all of these things, and yet, for the most part, we just accept the outputs of those systems and work with them. So the weather knowledge infrastructure is old. Uh, it goes back, really, to the middle of the 19th century with the telegraph, that is, in the modern form of this, even older in some other respects. But by the middle of the 19th century, there was a telegraph network all over Europe and throughout large parts of the United States and the rest of the world. Uh, 
And uh, almost immediately, it was used to send data about the weather from one place to another. And this became the first time that people were able to have a kind of uh, God's eye view of a large area, more or less all at the same time. So you get weather maps that look like this. You can see the isolines of pressure here, the isobars and the ocean currents. There's a high pressure zone up there and the wind directions in a few places. The interesting thing about this 1872 map is that it looks so much like a modern weather map. The basic system for representing it hasn't changed very much. It's a routine. Surface stations established all over the world starting in the 19th century. By 1900, covering uh, the US and most of the Northern Hemisphere. And by 1960, most of the land masses of the world pretty well covered with weather stations. So that's the basis for a global uh, forecast system that begins to emerge. And with the rise of computer models of weather, computer forecasting in the 1950s, you begin to get a steady improvement in the quality of weather forecasts. What you see at the bottom of this slide are new computers being introduced to the US Weather Service over time. Newer computers mean higher resolution models, more processes added to the models, and ultimately better forecasts. So that every 15 years, uh, the 72 hour forecast is now as good as the 36 hour forecast. Sorry, the, the, yeah, the 72 hour forecast is as good today as the 36 hour forecast was 15 years ago. So here, I picked this up yesterday morning. It's, what time is it here? It's four, about close to five o'clock. It should be about 60 degrees out. Anybody confirm that? Yeah, more or less. Sunny, yes. So, I mean, this is not, this is only two days, so it's not that great, but uh, you can get 15 minute forecasts for many parts of the world now that are very accurate, even for precipitation, which is the hardest thing to predict. So we have this well-developed system. It's routine. We accept it. We also know that it's sometimes wrong, and yet we use it. You know, if it says that, if the weather forecast tells you it's going to rain today, you're probably going to take a raincoat or an umbrella with you, even though it might not rain. And one of my interests in this has been the way in which generating, creating this global system to do global weather forecasting was both a vision of a thing that could be predicted this global weather patterns, and of an infrastructure that could do that. So both of those things developed at the same time. You know, the, people knew, of course, that the weather was a global system long ago, but this project of establishing systems that could measure all of it more or less at the same time and produce knowledge of it, that's been a deliberate project since the uh, early part of the 19th century. Okay, moving on to memory. So all the data that's collected by these weather, system, weather forecast systems is kept. And over time, that becomes climate data. Climate, as a climate scientist defines it, is essentially the average weather over a period of 30 years or more. This is what is sometimes called long data. People like to talk about big data. Long data is data that extends in time. And this piece of data right here is actually literally long. <laughs> it's an ice core. And as you know, those are used to look at the atmosphere of the past, even the very distant past, up to 800,000 years ago. There are bubbles of air trapped in that ice that have been you know, essentially in there for that length of time, and they're just like they were then. So we extract them, and with that, you can t tell something about the, uh, the composition of the atmosphere, the gases that were in the atmosphere at the time, and also uh, from the, the uh, striations in the ice cores, things about the density of snowfall and other, other factors. So very important piece of long data. With respect to measurement records, instrument records, these go back to the mid-19th century with ship's logs like these. By the early part of the 20th century, they were collecting them on a worldwide basis. This means worldwide network, worldwide web, if you will. Um, 
eventually converted to computer punch cards and today stored in giant tape libraries with many petabytes of data, mostly about simulations of the climate rather than actual climate data, which are not so, uh, don't, don't consume so much volume, but there's still many terabytes of, of climate data. So with all this, it's possible to produce climate knowledge. But there are problems with all data, and especially once you get to the scale of the globe. What you see on this slide are precipitation gauges in different countries being swapped out for new models of precipitation gauges at different points in time. And when that happens, so here they've added a windshield to the, the precipitation gauge, and it changes the reading just slightly. Here, this may not be the precipitation. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. So let's look down here. So here we have a shielded gauge added and with solid precipitation, so ice and snow. Um, it reads suddenly 16% less than the previous method of making the measurement. This happens all the time. New instruments, they're not uh, it's not that one is necessarily better than the other, but they have different characteristics. And if you know what the systematic difference between them is, you can adjust for that. But you must make that adjustment to get the closest, uh, the, the data to be as close as possible to what actually happened. So this is going on in every country, all the time, with every kind of instrument. And in order to make better climate data, scientists go back and look at events like this, figure out what the adjustment factors need to be, and adjust them. One way we do that, especially today, is with algorithms. And this is a really interesting view of things. So this dashed line here is snow cover as detected by satellites. So satellites can see snow in the sense that they can see brightness. And you know, if you're looking down at the Arctic, you, you are seeing a lot of white, but then you're also seeing some dark areas, which are forest or rock or open water in the ocean, something like that. So the satellite can see that mosaic, and it can't see it very well. It's like it's got a kind of blurry vision. So they carve it up into a grid, and then they have to decide um, if the grid is, say, three quarters filled with white, does that count as snow? Do we count that grid as snow? Or do we count it as three quarters and 25%? Or do we use some other technique for estimating what's in that grid, grid cell? So NASA used a series of different algorithms to calculate that over time. And that's what produces this dashed line here. Then we get into the late 1980s, and they recalculate all the same data using a single consistent algorithm. And they get a different result. And here you see that in the, the, their recordings of snow amounts for previous years were not as high as they are when processed using a consistent algorithm. So that means that the snow and ice decline has been greater than estimated previously. So this is the kind of thing that goes on all the time with respect to long data, not just in climate science, but in any science. You find out more about how data were made, you use some adjustments to, to make them commensurable, and you recreate the data. This is a much more recent version of that. This was in 2015. This is uh, the uh, National Environmental Data Systems, uh, sorry, Environmental Data Center. Uh, they've done some corrections to the previous corrections, and you see that there are, you know, very slight differences. Down here, they're showing you the correction with the new corrections, but then the uncorrected data, and you see that, in fact, if you were thinking about this as a graph of global warming, it, with the uncorrected data, the uh, climate, the, the, the warming would have been greater than with the corrected data. So one way I like to say this is that we have, in sciences like these, we have versions of the past, and they keep changing. They're not necessarily changing a lot, usually just changing a little. So we could say that they sort of shimmer. All right, now let's get to the subject that uh, is most closely related to truth. <laughs> 
the truce. And I want to start this by just, I just did a simple little exercise. I took the Google image searcher and I entered truce. And these are the images that pop up. Now, most of these are about the famous Christmas truce during World War I when the Germans and the uh, Allied forces played soccer together. They had a brief, you know, 24 hour truce and did that. But you see that there are also, you know, here's a couple of people clinking glasses. Um, there's a lot of handshaking going on. The point is here, this, you know, rough heuristic for what a truce is, is an act. It's people shaking hands, people making an agreement. Then we do the same search on truth. And I think the thing you can really see right here is that truth is just a word. It's just a word, it's not an act. And in a lot of ways, the whole lesson of science studies is captured in these two images. Because the argument that I would make, that science studies would make about this, is that truth is an act. Truth has to be made. Now, let's look a little deeper into these two words. If you look this up in the OED, the etymology of this word comes from Middle English and actually is related to words in several other languages, German and Dutch, notably. Um, true, true, trues, trues, you might say. So we have, what we have here are singulars and plurals, and this is the word that becomes truce. The original meaning of that word in Middle English was truth or fidelity to a promise, good faith, assurance of faith or truth, a promise, an engagement, a covenant. It's an act. You're making a promise. You are going to be true to your word. Now, the most interesting thing about this is that truce and truth are not just related words. They are actually the same word. So in Middle English, by the 16th century, this is how that word is spelled, except that it's pluralized. And the meanings of it, if you look in the OED, again, historically, the first meaning is the one that we were just talking about, loyalty, being trustworthy, if a person is true, that is a person who shows unwavering support and loyal and respect for a leader, a country, a cause, etc. The second meaning is the one that people are most often concerned with today in accordance with fact or reality. But that is a derivative meaning. So just hold that in your in your minds while we move on here. So I've been using this phrase, the glass laboratory, to talk about the, the ideal process of science. This is not the reality of all science, but the ideal. And that ideal dates back to the 17th century. And it, one way to think about it is that it, uh, it has to do with making knowledge in public. The way that that is most typically represented now, and even then, is with publication. We make something, make knowledge public. Uh -oh. So, you know, there's a, one of the great books of science studies is called Leviathan and the Air Pump, and it's about uh, Robert Boyle and the Royal Society of London and the performance of experiments in big rooms, arenas, if you will, where you know, people stand up at the front and they perform an experiment, and the audience all witnesses what happens in the room. And since they, the experiment has been witnessed, they can essentially certify that the result is as described in the publication. And that becomes, over time, what we now call peer review. You know, you send out the, the draft article to lots of people, also experts in your field. They review it. They say what's right and what's wrong with it. They check it. And then they certify this is ready for publication. It's also part of what the methods section that is standard in every science now. You know, this short description of exactly what you did. 
so that in principle, someone else at another time and place can now replicate what you did. In this universe of science, you are performing in front of an audience, whether the audience is physically present or whether it's virtual, whether it's simply reading the publication. And in that now rather distant world of, say, 30 years ago, um, if you were a, an experimentalist, or almost any kind of scientist, really, you would collect data. You might make a model, a simulation, or an, use an algorithm for processing your data, and those things were yours. You didn't publish all of that. What you published was a synthesis of the data, and people simply trusted that your synthesis accurately reflected the data themselves. Same thing with models. That was, that's your work product. So you don't publish it. You, you know, that's your special thing, and you keep that and maybe share it with others in some limited ways. Some of this was about the simple limits on publication of something like data. I mean, if you have an enormous data set, publishing, ah, excuse me, publishing it on paper doesn't make that much sense because most people won't care. It's expensive. Um, and if another scientist wants to use it, maybe they will ask you and you can do, it, do that as a kind of private arrangement. But some of it became more about the uh, intellectual ownership of the results and the, uh, the, the outcome of what you were doing. So in that world, data and models were typically not actually reviewed. They could be, and sometimes they were, but it was, that was rare. Now, one of the big questions all along through this process has been this one. Who counts as a peer for peer review? Now, notice that peer, today, you might think of a peer of the realm. And that is, in fact, the kind of origin of this idea that the people who witnessed Robert Boyle's experiments were gentlemen. And because they were gentlemen, independently wealthy, not in need of funding or uh, in need, needing to supplicate to anyone, they, were, they had the virtue of modesty and they would be reliable witnesses because they were not interested observers. Over time, that's changed and you know, in, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago, the image of scientists might have looked like this. More recently, maybe it would look like this. But in all these cases, the qualification is evident. The white coat says to you, these people have been trained and educated and vetted by other scientists. So a peer is another scientist, someone like you. It's not just anyone. That too we're going to leave on the table and we'll come back to it. So. Back to the, world, the weather information system, the climate information system. We have a, this immense system known as the World Weather Watch, project started in the 1960s, built from pieces that went back much further than that. Um, it essentially collects information from sensors of all kinds in the air, on land, at sea, in the oceans, and uh, sends them through a giant telecommunication system. Today, that's the internet, but previously it was purpose-built. Um, they go to a few computer centers with giant supercomputers that run computer models, make forecasts, and then send those forecasts on to the National Weather Services, who may process them even further and then send them out to their populations. As I said earlier, through this whole time, there have been many conflicts of many kinds. Um, they have been, some of them have been resolved. Many others remain, and yet the project works. So it continues because of the truce. With respect to climate knowledge, one good example of that is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, this thing I'm about to start working for. So the first assessment report in 1990, the IPCC is a, a kind of ad hoc organization of most of the world's climate scientists. Um, there are usually somewhere upwards of 2,700 uh, scientists associated with each report. They, their job is not to do science, but to evaluate all the science that's happened since the last report. 
And in 1990, that was pretty much everything, because this was the first report. And then what was being said, and this is about the time I came into the picture as a, you know, being interested in this issue and starting to study it, they would say, basically, the signal has not come out of the noise yet. We think this is gonna, there's going to be global warming because of human actions. We're pretty sure about that, but we don't really know. We can't point to a signal yet. Five years later, we have 1995, the balance of evidence suggests a discernible human influence on climate. 2001, new and stronger evidence. Climate change 2007, very likely anthropogenic greenhouse gases are causing climate change. That report and its authors won the Nobel Prize along with Al Gore in that year. And then in 2013, the most recent report, it is extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of global warming. So evaluating, assessing, working as a group, lots of tensions, lots of conflicts, not everything settled to everyone's satisfaction, and yet the knowledge organization continues. It's a truce. OK. Now I'm going to talk about three climate data controversies. And the path here is around 2000, we begin to get a lot more activity around climate science on the internet. That's not the first time, but this is when we'll just start at that point. And part of what the internet does is open up data, models, analysis tools, everything else about the science to a much larger public. So now, who counts as a peer that begins to change? So the first one I'll talk about is called the Hockey Stick and, the, and this blog called Climate Audit. So this is Michael Mann. He is a, a climate scientist at Penn State. Um, with some colleagues, he did an analysis of the last 1,000 years of climate history. What you see here is up here, the red, that's thermometer readings. So this is instrument records. All this back before here is proxy data from things like tree rings, corals, ice cores, and others. So less precise than the thermometer records, but correlated. And what you see is that more or less the temperature has been below this 20th century average here until the middle of the 20th century when it starts to rocket upward. Now the thing about this is that it disrupted a piece of knowledge that had been received by this community. So in the first IPCC report, 1990, this graph appeared. This graph goes back to 1965 in essentially exactly the same form without quite the, you know, the, the, the curve itself is identical. Some of the labeling is slightly different. To uh, Hubert Lamb, who's a great British climate scientist, Lamb had been investigating uh, the records from England and Iceland and a few parts of Central Europe and seen this kind of spike in temperature then, and then a decline in temperatures in the, so in around 1100, 1200 AD, you get this medieval warm period, and then this little ice age in the 17th and 16th and 17th centuries, and warming up after that. So that's kind of the way things appeared to a lot of people who were trained at that time. The thing is, Lamb didn't really claim himself that this was a global phenomenon, because that's not, he didn't have data for the whole world. But it became a global claim. This graph was repeated over and over again. It be became kind of received wisdom. And then if we look at man's graph and we overlay that graph, we see that the medieval warm period doesn't look so warm anymore. It, and the way climate skeptics interpreted this was that the goal of the graph, man's graph, was to get rid of the medieval warm period. So, they began to question this. And one of the main sources of questioning was this guy, Steve McIntyre. He's a retired Canadian mining engineer. He's got a pretty good head for numbers. He can run a, run a spreadsheet. He knows statistics. He had a colleague who's an economist, a Canadian economist, who's also pretty good with numbers and statistics. And this is the early days of blogging. 
right? So he starts this blog called Climate 2003. Welcome to Climate 2003. This is a website for corrections to the Man et al. 1998 paper. So they're going to do some analysis of this paper and, and check. And he starts to call it an audit. And in the writing about this, it's, it's really very interesting and I think very important because what he wants to say is peer review is not like audit in a financial situation. If you're a corporation, you need to have your books audited every year so that your shareholders know that what you said about your results is actually true. And the key thing is that you can't be audited by somebody who works for you because that would be corrupt. They would have an incentive to tell you what you want to hear and what the shareholders want to hear. So you get an independent auditor to audit your books. So that's their idea. We are going to audit climate science. We're going to go deeper and further than peer reviewers typically do, and we're going to recheck all their calculations, or at least some of them. How are we going to do it? We have some source data that Michael Mann provided to them, and we have a statistics package called R, which as you may know, is an open source code. So we're coming into the age of open data, open models, open code. This morphs into the blog called Climate Audit, which is a pretty interesting place. It's like the Wild West of climate science. There, you know, McIntyre himself is pretty hard-headed. Um, he will say some strong things about climate science, but he is not an ad hominem uh, attacker. But many of the audience for this are people like that who are just out to get the climate scientists that they are auditing. Well, this controversy over the hockey stick, which is so called because the long handle you know, stays down below that uh, 20th century average and then the blade goes shooting up at the end, so McIntyre asked Mann for data. He's you know, very polite about this. Mann gave him some data. He posted the rest. But then McIntyre kept going. And he didn't just want the data. He also wanted Mann's code. And Mann said, at that time, you could still say this, I'm not going to give you my code. I published the math. Make your own code. That the, the, the algorithm itself is my work product. Now today, people can't get away with that anymore. Today, you've got to publish that model. And most of the climate models, most of the climate data that are out there are now open. This led to hearings in the US House. Uh, it also led to oversight reviews by many sci major scientific institutions, the NSF, the National Research Council, the AAAS, et cetera. And finally, the National Research Council did a review, compared man's results to several others and what you see is that while there's some serious variation here, the general shape of all of these studies is the same. That they're in, Since the 1950s or 60s, there's been this in, strong increase in global temperature to a level much higher than in any time in the last 1,000 years. So this leads to, this is the emergence of what you might call an audit culture in climate science, and you start to see many things like this. Here's just one of a lot of examples I could show you. You've got people checking the, uh, the algorithm that's used to process climate data by the, the uh, Climatic Research Unit in the UK. So they're checking it. We have these top two are the graphs produced by two major climate data centers. And then the other five are all made by individuals. They can get the data now over the internet. They make their own algorithms, they run them, and what you see is that they produce more or less the same thing. So they're, they're very similar, but you know, our last audit here is by a guy named Chad. <laughs> so, so anybody can do this, is the, is the, uh, the idea. Now I'm going to talk about what to me is maybe the most interesting of all these projects, this thing called surfacestations.org. This project is run by a, a TV meteorologist called Anthony Watts, who runs a blog called What's Up With That. <laughs> that blog, What's Up With That, is the most visited 
climate website in the world. Watts thinks, I think I can still say this, he thinks that what's going on with climate records is urban heat island effects. So I built a weather station here in Evanston, you know, 150 years ago when there's not very much around. And over time, roads get paved, a lot more buildings get built, cars are there, industry is here, they're putting out heat, they're running air conditioners, there's asphalt that absorbs heat and makes the whole area warmer. So now I'm seeing a warming, but it's not because the, overall, the global climate is changing, it's because the local climate is changing, and that's because of human activity. So Watts says, we're going to audit all the surface stations that are used in the historical climatology network in the United States. And he gets the, uh, the manual that the Weather Service uses to evaluate weather stations. And he, pu he puts up this website and he says, I want volunteers to take this manual, go visit your local weather station, take photographs, write down everything you see, follow the instructions, and then report back. So they do. And eventually they audit actually most of the stations in the whole historical climatology network. And they find some things that are pretty scary. So here's a weather station. Here, this is the thermometer at the weather station right here. And it's right next to an asphalt parking lot. They've got air conditioning units with their exhaust fans, a cell phone tower here. And they find lots and lots and lots of things like this. Now, that's affecting that sensor for sure. <laughs> it's right there. So, you know, here's a, somebody who's stuck the thermistor in a box of electronics. Um, we were shocked by what we found. Nine of every 10 stations are likely reporting higher or rising temperatures because they are badly sighted. Sighting in meteorology means, you know, placement. So, evaluating the whole system, I mean, this is a staggering graph. They are saying that all these stations are reading four degrees, sorry, two degrees centigrade or higher than they should, and these red ones are reading five degrees centigrade higher than they should. You know, that's an enormous difference from what they should be reading. Is he wrong? That's the question. So some weather service guys decide to look at this and they take all the data that Watts has kindly posted on the website from all the volunteers and they run their own analysis. So first they check, did the auditors do a good job? And basically, all the red filled triangles and all the black filled dots are stations that have been verified by the National Weather Service. And yes, they are right. They are right. They saw what they saw and they reported it correctly. They did a good job. Now, what about the output? What about the data that come out of this network? So they take these data and they compare all the stations in the network, that's the solid red line, the well-sighted stations, that's the dashed line, and then the poorly sighted stations, the dotted line. And just ignore the, the last one for the moment. The graphs all look pretty similar. What could be possibly be going on? Well, if we were in an earlier presidential election, this would be funnier, but we could say, it's the algorithm, stupid. <laughs> Some of you will remember that. Um, so the conclusion is, yes, they're right about everything they said. But remember, the data are not the raw data from the thermometers. They're the processed data after adjustment by algorithms. And what we see here in their conclusion is that the adjustments have corrected for those problems and that's why the poorly sighted stations and the well sighted stations look identical. They're correcting. They're doing their job. No evidence that US temperature trends are actually inflated due to poor station sighting. Watts actually was a co-author on a, a paper about this that was finally published in a scientific journal after being you know, sent back a couple of times for peer review. And they reached exactly the same conclusion. 
with one small exception. So, another audit. And then the last one I'll talk about is the Berkeley Earth Surface Temperature Project. And there's an important backstory here. So, um, this is Richard Muller. He's a, a physicist at Berkeley, a very good physicist. He's also a climate skeptic. Um, he believed that Watts was right, that the urban heat island effect was the reason for the appearance of global warming. And he set out to do his own audit, his own check. And they're going to do it. This was only a few years ago. This was started in about 2008 or 9. And they did it. They published their methodology and their algorithms and all the data. And they collected a lot of data. So previous data sets, we see you know, going back into the 19th century, people have been trying to calculate the, you know, what, what's been happening to the climate. And back here in the later part of the 19th century, there's you know, this weird one and then others that are sort of similar, but you know, there's a lot of variation there. That's as much as the global war warming we're talking about today, that difference. And as time goes on, they come into closer and closer agreement. Well, part of what is going on here is just numbers. So because these people were all calculating by hand up until um, around, until Mitchell, um, they're using a relatively small number of, of stations to do the calculation. And then you get computers and algorithms, and they begin to be able to add a lot more weather stations into the data set. But Mueller <laughs> went out and found everything. <laughs> so he collected readings back into the uh, 18th century and lots and lots of stations that were never used before because their records are shorter or they had you know, interruptions or something like that. And because he hired a great team of statisticians and algorithm designers, he was able to design algorithms that could process all that stuff. Now Watts is waiting and he's saying, okay, now we're gonna know what really happened because Mueller is gonna find it out. And Mueller is invited up to Congress uh, I think this was in 2011. And the panel says, so what's your result? And he says, well, we haven't been, been through peer review yet, but we've done our preliminary calculations and they look pretty much like all the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> so Mueller actually converted himself. He, you know, he did this check, this massive audit, and the conclusion was they did a good job. They're doing it right. The algorithms work. So now let me talk about the siege. This is where we have to get political, and I could get a lot more political than I will be today. The Glass Laboratory today is a different kind of place because the peer group is so much larger. It's more like that. You know, so before, you could look in, but most people didn't. There was nobody around. You're out in the middle of the woods. Who cares? You know, we just look at the results. No one actually interrogates the science itself. Now, you've got a whole lot of people who are really interested in this problem of climate change. And a lot of them would really like it, emotionally speaking, if the result were not what it is. So they're going to check and check and check and check. They're going to check everything. And they start to use new techniques for doing this. One of them is to look at an email as a kind of metadata. What I mean by that is that, you know, I didn't talk about the climate gate controversy in 2009 when uh, you know, a whole bunch of emails were from the Climatic Research Unit were released. But, you know, there are some words and phrases in those emails that, of climate scientists that seem to indicate a kind of conspiracy to a lot of people. And to tell the truth, about it, there was some shady stuff in there, but not what the, many of the skeptics actually thought. Um, so there, has, there is now kind of an, a movement among some parts of the political universe to capture email from scientists and have that be kind of essentially part of the public record. So discussing with your colleague how we should adjust a particular data set that's seen it now as something that ought to be part of the record so that we can analyze that too. And you can see that there is sort of a point to that. 
mean, why do we make the adjustments that we make? What warrants that adjustment? That's a real issue. It's not the one that often appears in the, in the it's not done exactly as reported in scientific articles. So th there's been a resort to FOIA as a way of getting at these emails. And um, full disclosure, I contribute to this organization, the Climate Science Legal Defense Fund. They have begun to go after many, many, many people, not just a few. There is actually an organization, a, a law firm called E and E Legal, that specializes in go in FOIAing environmental uh, environment related information of all kinds. It does it from the federal government, but also from many other things. These are the the, the government documents it's, it has FOIAed, and its slogan is free market environmentalism through strategic litigation. <laughs> so what does that mean? Well, they want everything to be out in the open, okay, but the, the free market piece is the real clue here because the way a lot of this, the structure of this issue is, is presented in the skeptical or denialist media is it's not happening, but if it is happening, it's not us. But if it is us, it's too expensive for us to fix it. And besides, even worse, the government would get involved. So those last two pieces, I mean, I'm here partly channeling Naomi Oreskes, who couldn't be here today, and that's what she would be saying right about now. Um, it's those last two pieces that are the giveaway because the real thrust here is that if this is a serious global problem and the problem affects everyone and all societies and, and requires major changes in our lifestyles, that's going to lead to expensive government regulation. So this strategy of denialism, and this is again the thing that Naomi would be saying, the strategy of denialism goes back to the 1970s and 80s, and it appears in many areas, not just in climate change science. It has been piped through a set of uh, conservative think tanks like the Heartland Institute, the Marshall Institute, uh, the, the uh, American Petroleum Institute, a bunch of others that you know, have deliberately pursued strategies that point to government regulation as an evil and try to get at the science and sort of uh, confuse people about it or deny aspects of it in order to uh, make it seem like it's not an issue. All right, a bit more. So Lamar Smith, who is stepping down as chair of the House Space Science, Science Space and Technology Committee, um, his hobby horse has been with email amongst NOAA scientists, among other things, uh, wanting every aspect of their methods to be exposed, especially their private correspondence about it. And uh, you know, he says things that sound nice about evaluating uncertainties, but here you see the, you know, again, the rhetoric that is commonly uh, the centerpiece here. Expensive government regulation. More recently, we've got uh, Steve Pruitt, uh, sorry, Scott Pruitt, who jumped on this idea that, peer, that instead of just ordinary peer review with people taking their time, we should have a kind of red team, blue team exercise with proponents and opponents of global warming on television duking it out. So the, they call it a red team, blue team exercise, but the idea was on TV. So of course that medium privileges people who can speak about their conclusions in a few words and come up with crisp sound bites that are really popular and it's a very hot emotional medium. So my colleague at Michigan, Ricky Rude, who has been in these kinds of things says, red team, blue team exercises are not a mechanism for scientific debate. They're more like Heath Ledger's Joker in the Dark Knight causing disruption, distortion and chaos. So, so far, apparently the White House has reined Pruitt in on this issue, and maybe it will never happen, but he is still behind it, and it's still, we may yet see a thing like that happen on television. We have this phenomenon, which I really find just kind of amazing, but 
it's still it's happening. And this has also been a, a kind of typical denialist strategy on the right. If you get money from the government, it's partly the government piece, it's partly the fact that you're getting money. If you get that money to do science, that's a corrupting influence. So if you're going to review, I and mean, this is a policy now, that uh, if you receive a grant from the Environmental Protection Agency to do science, you cannot also advise the Environmental Protection Agency on the subject of that science, because that's corrupt. And yet, people from the regulated industries can advise the EPA. So, but this is framed as independence, getting advice, and counsel independent of the EPA. So the idea is if you're getting a grant, then you're kind of part of the EPA, even if you don't actually work for the EPA. Here's a cartoon that kind of captures this point of view, and there are many, many, many of these. You see, so, you know, the, the, the part that's hard to communicate to people who are not in the academic universe or don't know much about science is that the money that changes hands here is not personally enriching to scientists. <laughs> and that difference is the one that's constantly glossed over in this debate. It's like, oh, you're getting money from the government. You must be a government scientist. You're getting money, so you must be corrupted by that money somehow. Even if it doesn't change your salary at all, it's just to buy instruments and you know, do studies and et cetera. So, the most dramatic thing that's going on right now in the, in the present administration is defunding. Um, so the way I'm, I like to picture it now is that in the past, most of the attacks have been on the outputs of climate science. You know, so was it done right? You know, what's this result? Uh, you know, this can't be right. Now they're going after the inputs. So cli studying climate change is a waste of your money. We're just not going to do that. This was the, the, the FY 2018 budget. This did not happen. In fact, Congress restored all of these funds, but the same cuts are in the current budget that's under debate now. So this would have been a, you know, a massive cut, almost 30% uh, to the ocean and atmosphere research in general. I cut these little quotes out because, I mean, this is just fascinating. So this is from the budget document that NOAA produced justifying these cuts. So every agency has to produce a budget and has to say why we're doing what we're doing. And you can read in these cuts the agony that these people are going through and what they're, you know, they're, they're telling you right through the budget what's going on here. So the, climate, the eliminate Arctic research. This reduction will terminate Arctic research focused on improvements to sea ice modeling and predictions that support the safety of fishermen, commercial shippers, cruise ships, and local communities. NOAA will also terminate modeling of ecosystem and fisheries vulnerabilities. Don't need that stuff. Over here on the right, I won't read the whole thing, but we're also going to cancel this model that has emergency response applications, including tracking mercury de deposition and anthrax terrorism. We don't need that either. So, you know, they are, they're trying to tell you something in this document. <laughs> uh, the budget, and this is, these cuts are also back. Uh, the, the new head of NASA may play a role in this. That's Jim Bridenstine, who, Bridenstine, I'm not quite sure how you say it. He is uh, interested in weather, but he, he wants to reorient the mission of NASA away from knowing anything about planet Earth and focus it back on space. And they want to cut these satellite programs. Part of what's interesting about this is that this one, the Discover program, was originally proposed by Al Gore, made and then mothballed during the George W. Bush administration, then finally launched in the Obama administration. So it's out there. It, you know, satellite's already there. And what they're canceling is the data analysis. So the satellite is sending back data, and they're just saying, we're going to ignore that data. Okay, so let me sum up. We've got a traditional paradigm that looks kind of like this. 
Authority, scientific authority, based on certified expertise. The communities are small and they're homogeneous. Um, the peer, their, their publication is in peer-reviewed journals. That's not a large set. Data and models belong to you as their creator. Data analysis, you needed to have a, some specialized skill to do that. It took a lot of training. And expertise in a science required, you know, at least a master's, if not a PhD. So a lot of training, a lot of orientation, teaching. Today, we've got a different system coming out in which authority and trust aren't based in, on expertise. They're based on messaging and repetition. So one of the things I, I you know, I, I use Image Searcher a lot to look for things like graphs. And one of the things I've really noticed in the last five or six years is that Graphs from the denialist universe dominate, dominate every search for climate data. So just by putting them out there over and over again, they're changing the, what people see, what the general public sees. And of course, I didn't even talk about the erasure of the very phrase climate change from the EPA website and from other websites. Um, you cannot use the phrase climate change in a National Science Foundation grant application now. They're told that explicitly because you will not be funded. So we've got this much larger universe of people who care about science, the, this science. And that means that the vetting is being done by a crowd. You also have another way around the traditional mode of peer-reviewed science, which is just make your own journal. It's easy, and people do it a lot. There are lots of kind of gray journals, journals that more or less promise to publish your work if you'll just pay us a small page fee, um, journals that promise to peer review your work and get it in there. <laughs> so no matter what the peer, peers say. So we have that phenomenon. You can always publish it yourself, even if you can't publish it in a journal. We also have open data and open code, easily accessed. Anyone can do it. And finally, one of the things least noticed but probably most important is the tools for analyzing data. So statistics packages like R, like McIntyre was using, uh, data crunchers of all types are easy to get. And they don't take as much training anymore. You don't have to actually know what they're doing inside in order to use them. But to really understand what you're looking at, you still need that training. So one of the questions we face right now is how resilient is the truce that we need to get the truth that we want? Maybe if this whole system just collapses in the United States, is defunded and erased from our world, our, our country, other countries, the European Union, the Japanese, the Chinese, the Indians, they all have big scientific enterprises now. They're very serious. Maybe they'll just keep right on doing it, and we won't, it won't matter that much. Maybe there's a role for private enterprise. Um, maybe the Googles of the world can supply some of the missing data analysis. Maybe they can find new ways to generate data. What will happen to the Paris Agreement and the UN Framework on Climate Change with the US withdrawn? We are now the only country in the world that has not signed on. Even Syria, even North Korea have signed on to the Paris Agreement, but not us. And I'll just close with this thought. You know, Part of what we are seeing right now is that that earlier sense of true, to be loyal to a person, to a leader, is starting to dominate the sense that we all would like to see salient, which is the one about accordance with fact and reality. So thanks very much.